In this video, I'll be walking through my notes on NCR Level 3 Modern Physics. A link to the PDF and a list of corrections is in the video description. Photoelectric Effect When photons of sufficient energy strike a metal surface, electrons are ejected. Here we have our metal surface, our incident photons, and our ejected electrons, or photoelectrons. The energy required to eject electrons from a metal is called the work function of the metal. Here we have a collection of metals and their respective work functions. The unit for energy we're using is electron volts, which we'll be covering in the next section. The photoelectric effect demonstrated particle-like behaviour of light at a time when a purely wave theory of light was widely considered sufficient. Assuming light was a wave, the favoured explanation was that light shining on the surface slowly heats up the particles, causing them to emit electrons. We're now going to go through some expectations based on the wave theory of light and the observations which showed particle-like behaviour. Based on the wave theory of light, we would expect that increasing brightness would increase metal temperature and increase the kinetic energy of the electrons. In reality, more electrons were ejected and the kinetic energy was unchanged. Based on the wave theory, we would expect that dim light would take longer to heat the surface and eject electrons. In reality, using UV light, electrons were ejected immediately. Based on the wave theory, light frequency would not affect electron energy, when in reality, increasing light frequency increased electron kinetic energy and there was no ejection below a threshold frequency. I have here an electroscope a device used to indicate the presence of charge, atop which is a plate of zinc metal. Adding electrons to the metal with a balloon, imparting a negative charge, we can use ultraviolet light to eject the electrons from the metal, removing the negative charge. This is called the photoelectric effect. Repeating this process but with a sheet of glass in between, glass blocks the high energy ultraviolet, the remaining lower energy photons lack the energy to overcome the work function of the metal. Lastly, we can remove electrons by bringing the negative balloon close and providing a pathway for the electrons to escape. The metal is now positively charged. The ultraviolet light fails to remove the positive charge because the photoelectric effect can only remove electrons, which will only increase the positive charge. Electron volts. When describing energies on a particle scale, it's useful to have a unit of energy appropriate to the scale. For this, we define an electron volt as the energy required to move an electron through a potential difference of 1 volt. Electric energy is given by QV, where our charge Q is just our electron charge E, which is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs, multiplying that by our 1 volt, we get that an electron volt is equal to 1.60 times 10 to the negative 19 joules. To convert electron volts to joules, we multiply by this number. To convert joules to electron volts, we divide. Photoelectric cells. Photoelectric cells produce electrical current via the photoelectric effect. The cells consist of an emitter, upon which an incident light ejects electrons, which are collected by the collector. A voltage can be applied to determine the kinetic energy of the electrons. The stopping voltage is achieved when the kinetic energy is fully consumed into electric potential energy and current ceases to flow. This kinetic energy, equal to our electric potential energy, is equal to our electron charge multiplied by our stopping voltage. Photons Whereas phenomena such as diffraction demonstrates light as behaving like a wave, Phenomena such as the photoelectric effect demonstrate particle behaviour. The compromise is to consider light as a quantized wave packet, which we call a photon. The higher the frequency, the higher the energy. The exact relationship is that the energy is Planck's constant multiplied by the frequency. Photoelectric equation. The photon energy is consumed to liberate the photoelectron from the metal. Any excess energy adds to the photoelectron's kinetic energy. Mathematically, our photon energy is equal to our work function plus the kinetic energy. If the photon energy is less than the work function, no electrons will eject. Where this is our photon energy, and this is the work function of our metal, of which our photon energy is less. 
If the photon energy is equal to the work function, electrons will eject with no kinetic energy. If the photon energy is more than the work function, electrons will eject with kinetic energy. So part of our photon energy is used to liberate the electron, and the rest goes into the electron kinetic energy. Photoelectric Threshold Frequency the work function gives the energy required to liberate photoelectrons. Since photon energy is related to its frequency, we can also define a minimum frequency. Since E equals HF, at E equals the work function, we can write that the work function is HF, where our F is the threshold frequency. The threshold frequency is most often in the ultraviolet spectrum. Here are the same metals from earlier, and here are their threshold frequencies. Photoelectric stopping voltage. Consider the following circuit with a photoelectric cell, a voltage source, and an ammeter. When the voltage is such that the electric potential energy gained by the photoelectron equals its kinetic energy, current ceases to flow. And so our electric potential energy equals our kinetic energy. And since EP equals QV, and our Q is our charge of our electron E, EP equals EV. Since our photon energy is equal to our work function plus our kinetic energy, we can rearrange this for EK. Knowing that these two are equal, we can replace EK with EV. Photoelectric graphs. Graphing the intensity of light versus the current in the circuit, we observe an increasing trend because a higher intensity means more photons, which means more photoelectrons, which means more current. Plotting our frequency versus our maximum kinetic energy, we see that below a cutoff frequency, our kinetic energy is negative, meaning there is no emission. In order to eject electrons, the minimum energy we must provide is the work function of the metal. Above this cutoff frequency, our slope is h, as e is equal to hf, where this is our y, this is our x, and this is our gradient m. Plotting a graph of current and voltage, we see that below a certain cutoff voltage, we get no current, as the voltage is sufficient to repel all of the photoelectrons. Above this, we see an increasing current, and at zero voltage we have zero potential. At a certain point our current stops increasing, and we reach a point of saturation. For high intensity light we have more electrons being ejected, so we reach a higher current. The Bohr model. Several years later the Bohr model was developed to align with mounting evidence of quantized electron energies within the atom. It consists of small negatively charged electrons orbiting at distinct distances, and positively charged protons and neutrally charged neutrons existing in a dense central region called the nucleus. Hydrogen energy levels. The energy of an electron in the nth shell of a hydrogen atom is given by En is equal to negative Planck's constant multiplied by the speed of light multiplied by Rydberg's constant and divided by the energy level squared. The negative sign indicates that electrons bound to an atom have a deficit or debt of energy. Energy must be repaid in order to liberate an electron from an atom. Furthermore, the lower the shell number, the higher the debt. Excitation energy is the energy required to excite an electron to a higher shell, whereas ionization energy is the energy required to liberate an electron from an atom entirely. Hydrogen energy levels appear in distinct groups, due to energy differences between series being much greater than within. The Lyman series gives transitions to the first shell, Balmer to the second, Passion to the third, Bracket to the fourth, and Funt to the fifth. Atomic line spectra. When electrons within a gas are excited, they transition to high energy shells. As they transition back down, they release the energy difference as light. So we have our atom, we excite our electrons to higher shells, and they drop back down and emit light. Conversely, electrons will transition to high energy shells by absorbing light with the energy required for an available transition. So we can have the opposite process, where instead of electrons transitioning down and emitting light, we can have electrons absorbing light and transitioning up. 
Since the transition energies are different for every element, every element has a unique fingerprint of colours that they absorb and emit. We call these atomic line spectra. Here are a few samples, where on this end we have long wavelength, low frequency and low energy, and on the other end we have the opposite. In this experiment I'll be passing high voltage electricity through glass vials of gas. As the electricity passes through the gas, the electrons are excited into higher shells, and as they transition back down, they will emit distinct wavelengths of light. By placing a diffraction grating in front of my camera, we're able to separate this light by frequency, and see clearly our spectral lines. Hydrogen spectrum. We can use Rydberg's formula to describe the spectral lines for hydrogen, where 1 over our wavelength is equal to Rydberg's constant, multiplied by 1 over our lower shell squared, minus 1 over our higher shell squared. For example, an electron transitions from the fourth shell to the first, we start with our equation, solve it for lambda, substitute in our numbers, and get 9.72 times 10 to the minus 8 meters for our wavelength. This is an aurora. It occurs when charged particles from the sun enter Earth's atmosphere, and excite the electrons within its gaseous particles. The composition of our atmosphere is mainly nitrogen and oxygen, therefore the wavelengths of light we see, are primarily from these two atomic line spectra. Periodic Table Basics the periodic table displays elements in order of size and electron configuration. From our element symbol, we have our atomic number, which is the number of protons. And if the atom is electrically neutral, it is also the number of electrons. And our atomic mass is the combined amount of protons and neutrons. You may ask, why is this a decimal? This is because periodic tables typically give the atomic mass, as an average across all the isotopes, weighted by their abundance. And now to make things simple, here's a table of how to find the amount of any given particle. The proton is always the atomic number, the electron is the atomic number if the atom is electrically neutral, and the neutron is the atomic mass minus the atomic number. Isotopes. While every element has a fixed unique amount of protons, its amount of neutrons can vary. We call these different versions isotopes. For example, there are three main isotopes of hydrogen. Hydrogen 1 with an atomic mass of 1, Hydrogen 2 where we add a neutron, giving us an atomic mass of 2, and Hydrogen 3 which adds a further neutron to give us an atomic mass of 3. Forces between nucleons. The strong nuclear force attracts nucleons together over a short range. The Coulomb repulsive force repels only protons, but acts over a long range. Alpha, beta and gamma radiation. In this course we will be considering three types of radiation. Alpha radiation consists of two protons and two neutrons, which is essentially a helium nucleus. It's emitted when a nucleus is too large to be stable, it is the largest and slowest of the three we'll talk about, and because of its two protons it is positively charged. Beta radiation is an electron, which is emitted when a neutron decays, they travel near the speed of light, and since it's an electron, it's negatively charged. Gamma radiation is an electromagnetic wave, it's emitted when a nucleus has excess energy, travels at the speed of light, 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, and has no charge. Nuclear fission. Nuclear fission involves the splitting of a nucleus into smaller nuclei. There are two types of nuclear fission. Spontaneous, which occurs without intervention, where a unstable parent nuclei spontaneously decays into its daughter products. 
induced is initiated by an incident particle. So if we have a stable nucleus and fire a particle at it, the resulting nucleus splits into our daughter products similar to before. Once again the difference is the incident particle. A chain reaction occurs when particles released in one reaction are able to induce subsequent reactions. Nuclear reactors use chain reactions to achieve self-sustained energy production. Unlike reactors which are designed to achieve a steady rate of reaction, nuclear weapons are designed for uncontrolled, high-yield runaway reactions. Here we have a useful analogy for a chain reaction. We start with one reaction, which has the potential to trigger more reactions, and those reactions more of their own. The result is a rapidly increasing rate of reaction. Nuclear binding energy. When nuclei are changed from a less bound state to a more bound state, energy is released. Consider if you were to drop something on the Earth, this object has become more bound and in the process has released energy, usually as heat and sound. For nuclei larger than iron, smaller nuclei are more bound. These nuclei therefore release energy when fissioned. For nuclei smaller than iron, larger nuclei are more bound. These nuclei therefore release energy when fused. Plotted on a simplified graph of binding energy per nucleon against the amount of nucleons in a nucleus, we have a curve of elements becoming more bound and therefore releasing energy to fusion, becoming larger nuclei in the process. On the opposite side, we have nuclei being split into smaller nuclei, but likewise becoming more bound and likewise releasing energy. Right in the middle, we have iron, from which whether by fusion or fission, energy cannot be gained. In the year of 1958, the US Army detonated 35 warheads amongst the Marshall Islands. The test we're about to see detonated a 9 kiloton warhead at a depth of 150 meters. Five years later, a number of governments including the US signed a treaty that would ban many forms of nuclear testing, including the one we see here. Conservation laws. When a nuclear reaction occurs, the following quantities are conserved. Mass number, atomic number or charge, momentum, and mass energy. Note that mass and energy separately are not conserved. However, mass energy is, which is a quantity that recognizes E equals mc squared. Nuclear fusion. Nuclear fusion involves the combining of two or more nuclei to form larger nuclei. Here is one of many examples. For nuclear fusion to occur, the nuclei must travel with enough energy to overcome the Coulomb repulsion between the protons. The very high temperatures required for this to occur, upwards of 10 million degrees Celsius, are challenging to achieve on Earth. 